Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Lowy Institute. I'm Michael Fully, love the Executive Director of the Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's speech by Admiral Harry Harris, Commander of US Pacific Command. Let me recognise in particular one of my board members, Sir Angus Houston, and many other friends of the Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, this time last year I gave a lecture in Beijing, and I adapted the title of that lecture from the title of Dean Acheson's memoir of his time as Harry Truman's Secretary of State. Acheson called his memoir present at the creation, and Acheson's generation of statesmen were indeed the creators of the post-war world. So 70 years later, I called my lecture in Beijing present at the destruction, because it felt to me that the global order was, if not finished, at least fraying. And at the time, 12 months ago, I was criticised for being too gloomy. But now, Admiral, I realise, if anything, I was too sunny. We have seen significant discontinuities in the past 12 months. The decision by the British people to leave the European Union, which will, in my opinion, make for a distracted Britain, a less liberal Europe and a weaker West. We've seen a remarkable turnover in political leadership. We've noted a big shift in national politics and the rise of populist forces. So it's been a big year for a foreign policy think tank. Perhaps the most consequential development, of course, was the election of Mr Trump as president. And this has naturally led to a discussion here in Australia about the nature of our alliance with the United States and the future of America's role in Asia and the Pacific. In my opinion, the alliance is of strategic benefit to both sides. It is not an end in itself, but it is a means of protecting Australian security and furthering Australian interests. For us, I think the alliance is a force multiplier so I'm very pleased today to be hosting the commander of US military forces in the Pacific. On January 20th, there will be a new president in Washington, but Admiral Harris will still be there in Hawaii, so we're very interested to hear from him today. Ladies and gentlemen, PACOM covers half the world's surface and it's home to more than half the world's population. Now, as Admiral Harris knows, when it comes to US presidents, I'm an FDR man. And on most issues, FDR saw the future more clearly, I believe, than his contemporaries. And that's certainly true when it comes to the US role in Asia. In 1941, he gave his State of the Union speech, the famous Four Freedoms speech. And in that speech, FDR said, America looks forward to a time in which four freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear were realized. And he said, everywhere in the world. But here's a little anecdote that very few people know. When that speech was being drafted in the White House, Roosevelt dictated that, that element of the speech himself. And when he did that, when he, he said his confidant, Harry Hopkins, who was a great man, registered a protest at the phrase, everywhere in the world. He said, that covers an awful lot of territory, Mr. President. I don't know how interested Americans are going to be in the people of Java, for instance. And FDR replied, I'm afraid they'll have to be someday, Harry. The world is getting so small that even the people in Java are getting to be our neighbours now. So in 1941, when America was still an inward-looking, isolationist middle power, when it had not yet even entered the war against Germany and Japan, let alone emerged from that conflict as the world's superpower, Roosevelt was already looking forward to a period when the United States not only saw itself as an Asian power, but was represented in Asia in force and was a good neighbour to Asian countries. And 75 years later, PACOM is Roosevelt's idea given form in soldiers, sailors and airmen and women. Ladies and gentlemen, Admiral Harry Harris Jr. was born in Japan to a Navy father and a Japanese mother. He graduated from Annapolis and also studied at Harvard, Georgetown and Oxford. He served in every geographic combatant command. He was promoted to Admiral in 2013, assuming command of the US Pacific Fleet. In May 2015, he was appointed commander of US PACOM. He's also the, the Navy's grey owl, I'm advised, its longest serving active naval flight officer. He's a highly decorated military officer and a highly regarded strategist. Admiral, it's been a big year for the Institute as well as the world. We've published research that has been read in capitals everywhere. We've hosted Vice President Joe Biden, Director of National Intelligence, Jim Clapper, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, and many others. But let me say that by 
hosting you for our final event of the year. We're finishing on a high note. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Admiral Harry Harris to the podium. Thanks, Michael. I've been accused of many things, including being old, but I've never been accused of being a strategist. So thank you for that. Um, I appreciate the invitation to discuss our great alliance today, and I look forward to your questions uh, after I'm finished here. Uh, the Australia-US alliance, in my opinion, has benefited both countries uh, and is critical to the future of both countries. This alliance has strengthened peace and prosperity not only in the Indo-Asia Pacific, but around the world. The bonds between our nations are deep, from economic to culture to security. That said, from a cultural standpoint, I think that I speak for many Americans when I say that we just don't get Vegemite. <laughs> in fact, a quick Google search says it tastes like sadness. Uh, and we all know that the wisdom of the World Wide Web can't possibly be wrong. Uh, so I guess this gives us something new that we can work on together. Uh, but before going down this path too far, I want to acknowledge uh, Ewan Graham and the Lowy Institute and uh, Michael Fullove for bringing this great group of people together. Uh, Sir Angus uh, and fellow Flag and General Officers, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen, our allies. Uh, to begin my remarks, I'll paraphrase the famous uh, American author and humorist Mark Twain uh, and saying that the reports of America's abandonment of the Indo-Asia Pacific are greatly exaggerated. Let me assure you that nothing could be further from the truth. Our security commitments in this region remain strong. Uh, since November, we've conducted exercises with our partners in India, Papua New Guinea, uh, Indonesia, and Japan. And during that time, I've visited Vietnam, the Philippines, Sri Lanka, Papua New Guinea, where I came from just before landing here yesterday, and now, of course, here in Australia. And I travel to India uh, next month in January. And we continue to fly, we the United States, we continue to fly, sail, and operate wherever international law allows. So ladies and gentlemen, in the US, there's no such thing as a lame duck commander in chief. As I've done for almost eight years, uh, I continue to serve President Obama, my only commander in chief. Uh, I'll then serve President-elect Trump as my only Commander-in-Chief. And just as I have for President Obama, uh, I'll give President-elect Trump and Secretary of Defense designate Jim Mattis my advice and recommendations on all issues concerning this alliance uh, and this important region uh, of the world. That won't change on January 20th, and neither will America's enduring interests in the Indo-Asia Pacific. The U.S. has been operating in this region persistently for over seven decades, about as long as this speech is going to take. My point is that you can count on America now and into the future. I say this confidently because it's in our national interest to continue our engagement in this vital region as we support the rules-based international order, or what I like to call the global operating system. In place since the end of World War II, this system has advanced peace and prosperity. It's underpinned by American military presence and our network of allies and partners. Of America's seven defense treaties, five are here in the Indo-Asia Pacific, including and especially with Australia. Now, I'm sometimes asked why I use the term Indo-Asia Pacific instead of the more commonly term Asia Pacific when describing this critical region. My answer is simple. Indo-Asia Pacific more accurately captures the fact that the Indian and Pacific Oceans are the economic lifeblood linking the Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia, Australia, Northeast Asia, Oceania, and the United States together. Oceans that were once physical and psychological barriers that kept us apart are now the maritime superhighways that bring us together. Arguably, no nation knows this better than Australia, a Pacific power and an Indian Ocean power. A century ago, American naval strategist Alfred Thayer Mahan wrote about how the different maritime regions of the world were more consequential at different points in history. Early history, and according to him, was written in the Mediterranean. Mahan saw history unfolding in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea during his lifetime. And today, uh, I'll echo Secretary of Defense Carter when he says, that the Indo-Asia Pacific region is the most consequential region for America's future. 
This fact alone makes the U.S.-Australia strategic alliance more important than ever before. Since our alliance was formalized in 1951, it's been an anchor of peace and prosperity across 12 U.S. presidential administrations and numerous changes in the U.S. Congress and in Australia's parliament. Our alliance has mutually benefited both countries for 65 years because it's based on shared respect, shared values, and shared resolve. And I believe it will be the same with the incoming 13th administration across this alliance. Our two nations have worked, fought, bled, and died together. We fought in World Wars I and II. We fought communism in the hot wars of Korea and Vietnam and the Cold War through the latter half of the 20th century. We fought together in the Gulf War, and for the last decade and more, we fought side by side in the long wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. ISIL threatens all law-abiding, freedom-loving nations, including the U.S. and Australia. So I applaud Australia's leadership in this latest fight. The link between our countries is as important to our future as it has been to our storied past. And that's why I remain committed to my part in deepening our defense relationship. It's also worth mentioning that Australia's 2016 defense white paper is an indicator of the high degree of resolve this country has to maintain its national interests, including a commitment to increase defense spending uh, over the long haul. Australia's strategic leadership and unwavering commitment to a working with like-minded partners will continue to buttress the global operating system. I, for one, appreciate and welcome this kind of wise investment. With this uh, defense strategy in mind, uh, my good friend Air Chief Marshal Mark Benskin, the Chief of your uh, Defense Forces, and I signed a document just last night outlining the Force Posture Initiative activities between our two countries for the coming year. Candidly, our biggest hurdle was to figure out how to spell defense correctly, whether with an S or with a C. <laughs> Thankfully, we were able to work it out. Our intent with this document is to expand and increase opportunities for joint and combined training of our forces located in Australia. Our focus encompasses the enhanced air cooperation activities and the activities of the Marine Rotational Force Darwin. I assure you that this alliance is not sitting still. So I'll give you just a few of the wave tops uh, from this agreement. We're exploring greater integration of fifth generation fighter deployments to Australia and plan to see significant activities in 2017 that will introduce fifth generation fighter operations and requirements to the Royal Australian Air Force. Another example involves U.S. and Australian personnel performing integrated maintenance and ground support operations on C-17 aircraft, a first. Our Marines in Darwin will be just as busy conducting exercises and theater security cooperation events throughout the region side by side with their Australian counterparts. And yet another high level cooperation initiative I'll mention is the fact that Australian Major General uh, Greg Bilton is the Deputy Commanding General for U.S. Army Pacific. That's right, an Aussie general officer uh, is fully integrated as a partner at the top of one of my service component commands. Leading U.S. troops is a responsibility that I take very seriously and isn't something that we just give away. I mean, I, I, I look back to our history uh, with General uh, Bonash, Monash uh, back uh, in, in World War I. So Greg Belton's unique role demonstrates the deep relationship uh, our nations uh, have. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Australian Navy Commodore Ian Middleton's role on my staff at PACOM. For more than three years, he served uh, as the Regional and Multinational Engagement Advisor for Strategic Planning and Policy in J5, if you will. He does a lot of the heavy lifting to make our partnerships work throughout the region. So I look forward to the same high quality work from his relief, Air Commodore Phil Champion, uh, when he reports aboard next month. Folks, if any of you have been around aviators, you'll know that it's hard for us to talk about anything other than, well, ourselves. So in that, in that vein, uh, I'll mention that Australia recently received its first P-8A Poseidon aircraft, ahead of schedule, I might add. As an old P-3 guy who spent my career uh, in, in the maritime patrol business, I can tell you that this aircraft is highly capable and will improve our interoperability in maritime surveillance and anti-submarine warfare. I'd probably even eat Vegemite if they'd let me get back to flying to such a capable maritime patrol platform. 
you could turn sadness into happiness. India has also invested in this capable aircraft. It's, it's hard not to imagine the potential for all of us to collaborate on this hard problem that is theater anti-submarine warfare. And we're also reinvigorating our relationship with our Kiwi friends across the Tasman Sea. Just last month, the USS Sampson, a guided missile destroyer, pulled in Wellington and Auckland for port visits, the first US ship to visit New Zealand in over 30 years. Uh, this milestone and our relationship could not have come uh, at a better time. USS Sampson joined the HMCS, the Canadian ship uh, Vancouver, HMAS Darwin uh, from here and New Zealand's uh, HMNZS Canterbury to respond to the aftermath of the earthquake uh, in Kokora. This earthquake caused massive damage and I'm glad we were able to help a friend uh, in a time of need. At the end of the day, friends help friends and no one should doubt the long-term friendship between the United States and Australia. Uh, this commitment is important as we face the extraordinary challenges uh, in this region. In the here and now, the self-proclaimed Islamic State is a clear threat that must be destroyed. Uh, the main focus of our coalition's military effort is rightfully in the Middle East and North Africa. But as ISIL is eliminated in those areas, some of the surviving, surviving fighters will likely repatriate to their home countries in the Indo-Asia Pacific. What's worse is they will be radicalized and weaponized. So it's clear to me that ISIL is trying to rebalance to the Indo-Asia Pacific uh, as well. So we must stop them now. But we can't do it alone. And to halt ISIL's cancerous spread, we must work together with like-minded nations uh, in the region and across the globe. Only through multinational collaboration, partnership with a purpose, can we eradicate the ISIL disease before it metastasizes in the Indo-Asia Pacific. But ISIL isn't our only immediate threat in the region. North Korea stands out as the only nation to have tested nuclear weapons in this century. Now, I want you to stop for a minute and really think about this. Combining nuclear warheads with ballistic missile technology in the hands of a volatile leader like Kim Jong-un is a recipe for disaster. I know there's some debate about the miniaturization advancements made by Pyongyang, but PACOM must be prepared to fight tonight, so I take them at their word. I must assume that their claims are true. I know that their aspirations certainly are. So we must consider every possible step to defend the U.S. homeland uh, and our allies. Other significant challenges are posed by revanchist Russia and an increasingly assertive China. Both Moscow and Beijing have choices to make. They can choose to disregard the rules-based international order or they can contribute to it as responsible stakeholders. The U.S. obviously prefers that they choose to respond um, responsibly. No one, including me, wants conflict. I've been loud and clear that I prefer cooperation so that we can collectively address our shared security challenges. But I've also been loud and clear that we will not allow the shared domains to be closed down unilaterally, no matter how many bases are built on artificial features in the South China Sea. I say this often, but it's worth repeating. We will cooperate where we can, but we, we will be ready to confront where we must. Our alliance also deters potential adversaries from unilaterally rebooting the global operating system that has served the many nations in the Indo-Asia Pacific for so long. Deterrence occupies a large portion of my time, so I'll give you my thoughts on it. President Reagan once said, we cannot play innocence abroad in a world that is not innocent. We cannot play innocence abroad in a world that is not innocent. This statement is as true today as it was in the 1980s. The world is a rough place, uh, that is made more stable and prosperous through principled actions of nations like Australia and the United States. When we think about deterrence, I recognize that military power and strategic effectiveness are distinct concepts. Military might alone can't guarantee victory. All elements of national power, like diplomatic and economic, must be involved to bring about the desired strategic ends. And keep in mind that deterrence is in the eyes of the beholder. For deterrence to work, all the elements of national power must be applied and understood by adversaries and potential adversaries alike. Because I'm from Tennessee, if you can't tell already, uh, I'm sometimes accused of simplifying the complex into something that's easier to understand. 
Uh, and to that, I say guilty as charged. So here's the Harris formula for deterrence. Capability times resolve times signaling equals deterrence. Capability times resolve times signaling equals deterrence. Now, all three elements, capability, resolve, and signaling, must be present for deterrence to exist. And because we're doing multiplication, not addition, we're doing multiplication. If any of those are zero, you get no deterrence, right? If any of these are zero, it's multiplication, you get no deterrence. But, and so let me, get, let me get through each of those with you. By capability, I mean all elements of national power, including the military, but not exclusively the military. Resolve is a commitment to use that power when required to, to meet national security objectives. And signaling is about communicating resolve and capability through words and actions that the other side receives loud and clear. There's no room for subtlety here. So I'll be blunt in saying that the global operating system that created the Indo-Asia-Pacific economic miracle is coming under pressure from revisionist powers. So the question becomes, how do we maintain the system and at the same time effectively deter nations or violent extremists from unilaterally changing it? Three, three ways to do that, in my opinion. First and foremost is the absolute necessity to maintain credible combat power. History tells us that revisionist powers with growing military capabilities often make use of those capabilities when they believe that the possible gains outweigh the risks and costs. So it's critical that Australia and the United States maintain the capability that ensures access to the shared domains of the air, sea, space, and cyber under all circumstances. Second. We must have the resolve to confront any adversary and defend our allies against both aggression and coercion. We must have the resolve to ensure access to the shared domains. We have to mean it. The U.S. fought its first war following our independence to ensure freedom of navigation. And we did that when we were weak and small. This is an enduring principle and one of the reasons our forces remain ready to fight tonight. We will continue to exercise and protect our rights on the high seas, in the air, in space, and in cyber, wherever international law allows. Third, we must expand our partnerships of like-minded nations to support the global operating system, the principled security network that Secretary Carter often talks about. Now, while I've been a PACOM commander, I've emphasized the need to enhance uh, multinational partnerships or partnerships with the purposes, I like to call it. These partnerships advance national interests outside the confines of the old U.S. hub-and-spoke alliance model. For example, with our Korean and Japanese allies, we're finding new ways to defend Northeast Asia, especially from the persistent threat that North Korea presents. We can counter violent extremist organizations like ISIL by collaborating with our allies and partners that may have elements in their country sympathetic to ISIL's cause. The Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Bangladesh, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and the U.S. could be a natural partnership countering violent extremist organizations with this purpose in mind. I've also spoken about the benefits of a democracy quadrilateral that enhances security cooperation between Australia, Japan, India, and the United States. To this end, as we speak, Commodore Milton, the Australian one star that I talked about earlier, he's in Tokyo representing PACOM. He's the U.S. representative uh, to the trilateral U.S.-Japan-Australia talks. Finally, we should continue to deepen our cooperation with ASEAN to take on other missions of, of mutual interest from humanitarian assistance and disaster response to counter piracy, to, to counter trafficking uh, in all its bad forms, and counter proliferation. Individually, these partnerships work toward their stated goals, while at the same time, they collectively enhance the global operating system. This is noble work folks, in my opinion. No country should fear our alliances or our principled partnerships as we work together to continue to ensure access to the shared domains. Now, folks, I've talked too long. If any of you can remember all the way back to, I don't know, 15 minutes ago when I started my talk, I made reference to Vegemite, remember? So uh, let me close with a cultural reference that does resonate, mateship. This concept exists beyond friendship. It's loyalty and knowing with certainty who has your back. This is an, an iconic concept, uniquely Australian, yet instinctively understood by Americans who've come to know this great country uh, and its people. As we commemorate the 75th anniversary 
of important World War II battles in the next few months, to include Pearl Harbor um, last week and the next year's bombing of Darwin, Coral Sea, Midway, Guadalcanal, and the Kokoda Trail, among others. We remember that Australia and American interests and values have intertwined our histories. Our alliance is both defined by its storied past and invigorated by its balanced future. No one issue defines this enduring alliance. And because of our mateship, we should feel emboldened that we can overcome any future challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always a deep personal pleasure for me to be in Australia to discuss our vital alliance, an alliance forged in battle and a stand to defend liberty, and one that stands today as a shining example of working to maintain these hard-earned freedoms. I started the discussion by saying that I'll continue to give my best counsel to President Obama and then to incoming President Trump. One piece of advice that I provide has been consistent and will never change. The Australia-US alliance matters to our two great nations. It matters to the Indo-Asia Pacific region, and in my opinion, it matters to the world. No one should doubt the staying power of this alliance to maintain security, prosperity, and peace. May God bless each of you. May God bless Australia and the United States. And may he keep our alliance on a path of strength for years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Admiral Harris. That was, um, you have the largest command um, of all of them. Um, that was an impressive sweep uh, across that, uh, that broad swathe of geography and all of its, uh, its trouble spots and challenges. Um, let me pick you up on one of them. Uh, you mentioned North Korea uh, in particular terms um, as one of the areas where the, you may have to confront that issue of whether you have to fight tonight. And I think in the Korean Peninsula, it means uh, more probably than anywhere else in, in your beat. But I, I shouldn't uh, presuppose that in your answer. Um, you talked uh, in your definition of, uh, of deterrence, that equation that you laid out, capability, resolve, signaling. Uh, what would be your precise um, advice to the incoming Trump administration uh, on that issue of, of how you would maintain signaling given the unpredictability, given uh, the leaps and bounds that North Korea has made on the missile and nuclear fronts? That's a great question and one I'm going to dodge. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you why I'm going to dodge it because I'm not in the business of giving advice to the president elect. Uh, you know, uh, when he becomes my commander in chief, and if he asks for my advice, I'll give it to him. But the advice that I've uh, given uh, to my chain of command, the National Command Authority that exists today, uh, with regard to North Korea, is we must maintain this credible combat power that I talked about. We must continue to, to demonstrate our resolve as an alliance with South Korea. And I'm happy to report that the relationship, the, the bilateral relationship between uh, Japan and Korea, South Korea, uh, has grown significantly. Uh, and uh, that, that presents, in my mind, a deterrent uh, to North Korea. And, and uh, you know, uh, uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I think North Korea has done as much to improve uh, the relationship between Japan uh, and South Korea uh, as anything else. Uh, and so I think that's the, the key to maintain credible combat power, to demonstrate our resolve, to continue with sanctions, to increase the sanctions uh, as necessary, and uh, to work closely with China on this. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, China, uh, while its influence over North Korea is, is probably waned, it's the only country that has uh, that kind of um, uh, soft power influence uh, over North Korea. So I, I think we have to work with, with China and encourage China to continue to pressurize North Korea to give up its nuclear ambitions. Ladies and gentlemen, Admiral Harris has kindly agreed to stay on with us to take questions for about 15 minutes. Um, so please uh, concentrate your questions and, and keep them as short um, and to the point as possible uh, and identify yourself, please, too. Um, I'd like to go first uh, at the back of the room to my colleague, uh, Hervé Le Mahieu. Thank you. Thank you, Ewan. My question is uh, really to do with how, or to what extent, revising the One China policy 
by your next commander in chief would complicate your life. I know you're not in the business of giving advice, at least not in public forums, but it presents some interesting angles. On the one hand, it could be framed as a as a as a way of as a rev revisionism, um, and 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 thereby work to undermine um, the the rules-based order that you've uh, worked so hard to to uphold in the Indo-Pacific region. On the other hand, um, it could also serve a tactical advantage um, to, to the US um, in curbing um, the military adventurism of China, at least by making the risk or the costs higher. If you would care to give your thoughts on that, very delicate issue, it'd be yeah, appreciated. It's a, it's a great issue, and I, and I noticed that after I arrived in, uh, uh, in Sydney yesterday, there was a big uh, splash on, on the news about it. So let me start off by saying that I'm not going to grade the president-elect's homework. You know, that, that's, that's not a place that I, that I want to be in, nor is it a place that I should be in. But with regard to the one-China policy, it is the U.S. policy, uh, the one-China policy framed by the three communiques and the law. And the law is the Taiwan Relations Act. So I am completely um, comfortable uh, uh, working in that framework. And I understand completely my obligations uh, with regard to uh, Taiwan uh, under the law, the Taiwan Relations Act, which governs uh, my relationships, uh, relationship with Taiwan. Uh, we have a strong mill-to-mill uh, -mill relationship with Taiwan, uh, governed by the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, I meet with my counterparts from Taiwan uh, in Hawaii, uh, and we conduct uh, uh, engagement activities with Taiwan on a routine basis in order to meet our obligations under the Taiwan Relations Act. With any any future change to that, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it would be speculative at best. Uh, so I'm going to wait and see what happens uh, 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 in January. Um, Meriden Moral at the, at the back. I'll take two questions together, um, and then Ashley Townsend. Thank you, Admiral. That was a very interesting and, um, and entertaining speech. I do have some issues with your uh, conceptualization of Vegemite, but we'll leave that. Um, <laughs> that aside... That's, secret weapon. <laughs> that's right. Um, so you talked a lot about the rules-based order and the global operating system. And I wanted to know, do you conceive of that as being absolutely fixed? Uh, as it is right now, or is there any room for evolution or change to some of those rules in that rules-based order? And where I'm going here is you described Russia and possibly China, although you didn't say so specifically, as revisionist powers. Is it possible that they are able to influence the rules-based order and cause some evolution to it in a positive way? Is that, is that a possibility? And the second question, the second part of that is signalling. How do you signal to China to engage responsibly and to make positive contributions to the rules-based order? And do you think the US has been successful so far in being a positive, creating positive signals to China? Thanks a lot. And the second I've question. I've just got to write this down, so. Sure. I've got to unpack that just a little bit, so. Okay, next. Uh, thanks, Admiral. Uh, Ashley Townsend from the United States Study Center. Um, it would be remiss of all of us to not ask a question on the South China Sea. Um, uh, in terms of your deterrence framework, uh, the deterrence equation, it would seem that freedom of navigation operations fall into the signaling category. Um, I wonder how important do you think it is for other countries, without grading their homework, to also signal in this way? Um, given now that the islands are well on the way to being militarised, is it still important to signal our capacity to operate freely in international waters along the lines of the rules-based order that currently exists? And because freedom of navigation operations can't actually change the, the, the facts on the water, so to speak, they can't roll back China's yeah. islands, what other measures do you think uh, the future administration or others in the region should be thinking about to, uh, to put pressure on China to change its behaviour around those islands? So uh, both questions are related, and, and uh, so I, I, hopefully I've written them all down correctly here so I can get after them. Uh, with regard to Russia and China, uh, can they influence the rules-based international order, the global operating system? Sure they can. Uh, they, they can influence it positively uh, or negatively. 
Uh, I would say that their actions uh, in the recent past have been in the, in more negative than positive, but I hope that they can you know, turn that into a, 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 a positive influence. So when I talk about China, uh, I, I talk about, uh, on the one hand, uh, we should give them credit for the good things they've done. So if you reach back over the last three years or so, you know, China was involved, uh, or China has been involved now for more than a couple of years, for 22 iterations of the counter piracy operations uh, off the coast of Africa. That's a positive. They were involved in the, in the removal of chemical weapons from Syria. Uh, that's a positive. Uh, they were involved in the search for MH370 right here uh, in, off the coast of Australia. They're on your opposite coast. They have the largest number of ships there uh, other than any country except for Australia's. Uh, that's a clear positive. They've been participants in RIMPAC now, the Rim of the Pacific exercise, in 2014 and 2016. In 2014, they brought four ships invited and a fifth ship uninvited. Uh, probably, you know, that's a neutral, I guess. And, and this, this year, they brought only those ships they were invited to bring. So that's a positive. So these are good things that China does, and we should give them credit for it and acknowledge that, and they positively influence the global operating system and the rules-based international order. On the other side of the equation, though, on the other hand, on the negatives, is their assertive, aggressive behavior in the South China Sea, uh, their, uh, their uh, 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 support of, or, or their, their conflicts with India along their, their long border, uh, and other things like that, which I view as a negative. But the military space, and when, when we're dealing with China, is only a fraction, only a part, more than a fraction, but it's, it's only a part of the overall relationship that we have with China, uh, that Australia has with China, and that the rest of the world has with China. And no one is asking, let alone me, no one is asking Australia uh, to make a choice between China and the United States. You know, I, I said earlier today that Australia is more than capable of chewing gum and walking at the same time. And so, you know, we're not asking you to, to make a choice. Uh, and I think that, that the, uh, the alliance, though, matters, as I spoke in, this, in, uh, in my remarks here earlier. The alliance matters, and it matters fundamentally, not only to each of our countries, but to the region uh, and the world uh, itself. So how, how do we signal China? Uh, we signal them across all elements of national power. You know, so this gets at the issue of whether uh, other countries should do freedom of navigation operations. And that's up to each country. This is a decision that Australia has to make, that Japan has to make, uh, that Vietnam or Philippines, you know, it's, it's up to each country. But at the end of the day, what we're about is ensuring uh, the furtherance, the continuance and the furtherance of this rules-based international order. So you have to make your own decisions uh, on whether you're going to conduct freedom of navigation operations in the way that we do or not. But that's one way of signaling China. The most important measure of signaling, in my opinion, is in the diplomatic uh, and political space spaces. So, you know, I, I talked in my speech about this equation, but I also said that that the military uh, piece uh, is is a, is is distinct from other elements uh, of national power in in regard with regards to signaling. And I think that's where government to government activities matter. Uh, you know, uh, our opinion of China matters to China. How we talk about China globally uh, matters to China. So I think there's, there's, uh, there are other uh, ways to signal China uh, that we're displeased uh, with their activities in the South China Sea, even as we compliment them and acknowledge the good things that they're doing in, in other uh, parts of the security space. Uh, to the question of uh, should others signal in, in this way in the freedom of navigation operations? I think so, but, but that is, again, up to each individual country to make that decision. So freedom of navigation operations itself has been characterized lately, lately in the last couple of years, uh, as a tool uh, for deterrence. But it's not that. It's simply a tool to ensure that our freedom of navigation uh, is maintained globally. And so we conduct freedom of navigation operations not only against uh, what we view as uh, uh, improper uh, maritime claims by China, we conduct freedom of navigation operations against 
uh, uh, claims that we think are invalid by a whole host of countries, including our friends. Uh, because if you don't exercise freedom of navigation in, in international law, then, then you could lose that freedom of navigation. So th that's the only purpose of freedom of navigation operations, is to, is to challenge those claims that uh, we think are invalid in order to uh, underscore and support, underpin uh, freedom of navigation globally. And I think at the end of the day, and I've talked to my counterparts in China about this, you know, our conduct of freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea benefit uh, all uh, maritime nations, including China. As China's navy grows bigger and uh, uh, has a, a more uh, global reach, if you will, then they're going to appreciate the freedom of navigation concept in other countries and other regions of the world. So this helps not only us uh, and Australia and our friends, allies, and partners, but also China, for that matter. I think they just need to take a little bit longer view uh, in my mind. And time to take one brief question. I saw um, David Rose hand up first in the front row. Um, David Rose, you see more just, just wait till there's a mic on the way. Fellow, um, fellow veggie mind skeptic as well, as happens. Um, you touched on fifth generation um, integration in Northern Australia. I just wonder if you can give us some specifics on that over 2017 and perhaps just expand on the theme a little bit and share with us your hopes um, for expanding US high-end air power in, in Australia, including in um, uh, Cocos Keeling Island. Yeah, so um, what, what I was getting at uh, uh, with the fifth generation integration is F-22s this year, or, or in, in 17, which, which I think is, is a very uh, uh, positive uh, indicator of the seriousness of, uh, of, of our uh, uh, EAC thing that we're doing. Because the uh, F-22 is our, our, our current fifth generation fighter, uh, and uh, it's extant now in, in, in good numbers. So we're going to bring down some F-22s to, to work uh, with Australia to demonstrate the airplane and, this, and some of the unique maintenance and other aspects of fifth generation airframes. So I think that's a positive. And then F F-35s will be coming, um, not, not, in, not scheduled next year, but F-35s are of course coming into our inventory and in your inventory. So this is, this is a positive and F-22s will start to lead, lead that way. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the other common airframes that we have, uh, again, underscore uh, our um, uh, interoperability and the seriousness of our relationship, including the P-8s. I think you just got your first P-8. Uh, we've got MA-60 uh, Romeo helicopters, uh, the, 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 the wedge tail, the surveillance aircraft, and all of that. These are, th these are high-end uh, aircraft uh, that, that enable us to operate uh, closely together, which I think is important uh, in this alliance. Abril, I'm going to stretch your patience and uh, ask just one more question to the lady in the third row. Just wait a second, the microphone's nearly there. Thank you. Hi, Jenny Golubeva with ABC News. Um, if, um, if we look at an improved relationship with uh, Russia under an incoming Trump administration, what effect will that have on international issues, including in the South China Sea? So, again, I, I don't want to speculate on on uh, uh, the, 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 the incoming administration in any way. You know, it's improper. But I will just say generally uh, that any improvement in our relationship with Russia uh, is, is, is helpful, right? But, it, you know, Russia, you know, we, we have, the, the, the relationship we have with Russia is where it is today because of Russia's activities and their actions. So if we can improve that and, and still achieve our strategic aims with regard to their actions that have caused us to be in the place we're in, then I think that's a positive. Uh, and Russia is a great power. Uh, uh, and and I, I think that, uh, you know, that, that anything we can do to, uh, to improve that is, is a positive as long as we uh, maintain uh, the steadfastness of our resolve with regard to the actions that, that Russia has done. Thank you, Admiral Harris. Could you just stay at the podium for one more minute and I'll invite up Michael Fully Love to give some closing remarks. Well, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree today was a, that was a very interesting, a very substantive and even a very amusing speech. And let me do two things quickly. First of all, let me thank Admiral Harris for, for 
for his speech and for taking our questions. I like the idea of the global operating system, Admiral. I'm afraid that the 2016 version of the GOS has a bug in it. Um, I, I have to correct you. Vegemite doesn't taste like sadness. Vegemite tastes like victory. Um, <laughs> but, but I would like to thank you for conceding ground uh, in those difficult negotiations and conceding that defence is spelled with a C, not an S. It takes a strong man to compromise, Admiral Harris, so I'd like to thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Admiral Harris. Thank you, sir. Se secondly, and just quickly, I think historians will look back on 2016 as a very important year in international history. It's been very busy for us, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank everybody who supported our work this year, from my chairman, Frank Lowy, our board, represented today by Sir Angus Houston, my colleagues at the Institute who've done remarkable work, but also to you, our supporters, our audience, our listeners um, and our readers. Thank you all. I wish you all a happy Christmas, a restful break, and we'll see what 2017 brings. Thank you very much. Thank you again.